right, we're at nine o'clock, so I'm gonna go ahead and get us kicked off here. Um, you are uh, here to attend the Properties and Buildings, Transportation Considerations for Phase Reopening. Thanks everyone for joining us today as we cover what you'll need to know, um, hopefully most of what you'll need to know about transportation during phased reopening. Um, today we'll be going over the transportation landscape in Seattle, looking a bit at the past and present, and then pivoting to walk through a few commute modes um, with ideas and considerations that you should take into account for your properties and buildings. Um, a few housekeeping notes today before we get into the content. Uh, so we cannot see or hear, uh, we cannot see or hear you at all. If you have questions, please post them in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, and there's quite a bit of information in this presentation, um, so we'll move through fairly quickly, but we will send slides and the recording out afterwards um, in case you missed anything and want to go back. Um, now to kick us off, I'm going to hand it off to Matthew Combe, who's Executive Director of the Seattle 2030 District. Thanks, Dylan. Um, so thanks everyone for being here. I think, uh, as Dylan said, we've got a lot to cover today. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the CL2030 district. Uh, and then we have both Sarah and Dylan here to kind of go over that great information. Uh, Commute CL is uh, an awesome partner of the CL2030 district. Uh, and these guys really know their stuff. So if you have any questions, please do put them in that Q&A box. Um, and any questions afterwards, they're always readily available to uh, take those questions. Um, we can skip this slide just because you already know why we're all here. Um, so, like I said, I'm the executive director of the Seattle 2030 district. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that is working in downtown Seattle with property owners and, dev and developers primarily. Uh, and we're committed to transforming our city by significantly reducing the environmental impacts of buildings by the year 2030. Uh, and we're doing this because without transformative change in Seattle, then we're going to lose the climate battle in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we're uh, an organization that we think has a unique ability to connect and convene decision makers who can really influence the corporate culture uh, and help create policies to help solve that climate crisis. Um, so next slide. And there's another little bit about what we do. We're creating a business model for urban sustainability through collaboration and leverage finances and shared resources, which is kind of what we're going to do today. Uh, so like I said, we're uh, uh, located in downtown Seattle. Uh, you can see from this map that we're pretty much go from the Starbucks Center in Soto up to uh, Lake Union, and then from the waterfront up to uh, Capitol Hill and First Hill. We have an MOU with Capitol Hill, so a, um, Capitol Hill Eco District, I should say, which uh, encompasses quite a lot there of Capitol Hill. Um, 260 buildings are currently committed to the 2030 district goals, which is a 50% reduction in energy, water, and transportation emissions by the year 2030. And if we achieve those goals, then it puts us on a path to climate stabilization by the year 2030. And then hopefully we can work towards being carbon neutral by 2050 and achieving the Paris climate goals. So uh, next slide. Um, so we're a community of leaders. These uh, on here are the membership uh, types that we have in the district. So we have those 260 member buildings are owned or developed by 49 of our members. Uh, and then we have 45 professional stakeholders. Uh, professional stakeholders, anyone in the architecture, engineering, general contracting world, the kind of the people who are doing the work in the buildings to try and achieve those goals. And then we have 19 community stakeholders. Those are other nonprofits with similar, similar goals to us or working towards uh, similar goals and also the city and the county are community stakeholders. And then we have 10 strategic partners. Uh, an example of a strategic partner is Commute Seattle. They're uh, an organization that is already doing great work in transportation. So we don't necessarily need to recreate that work. We can just partner with them to, to achieve those goals. All right, next slide. 
So this is uh, how we work. Um, the first thing that we do is we try and uh, convene business leaders and government officials to create those policies and incentives that will work for both parties uh, in order to try and achieve the district goals. We understand that we've got some pretty lofty goals and we only have 10 years to achieve them. So we need to bring both of those parties to the table to make sure that these incentives work for everyone. We provide education sessions. Uh, this is a prime example of that. And we try and provide those to our, all of our members, but particularly to our property owners and managers on the new strategies that are out there to try and achieve the goals. Um, most recently, we've been concentrating on how to reopen buildings with occupant health in mind while also proving efficiency. And I think we're gonna touch a, a lot on that today. Um, the demonstration we provide, uh, a lot of demonstration projects with a lot of those new technologies that um, we try and educate people on uh, to our members and try and bring those products to market quicker. There's a lot of products out there uh, and it's hard to try and figure out what exactly will work and what won't. And we try and kind of go cut through the noise for our members. Then uh, we advocate for new policies and incentives. Uh, I've touched upon this a lot where we are working with the city and county governments to create uh, these policies. We understand that our members are very busy and they often don't have time to sit at the table and kind of work through the bureaucracy of creating a policy or an incentive for the city. So we try and do that for our members. We facilitate conversations amongst building owners to share information. Um, one thing that our members really agreed upon when the district was formed is that they compete on everything to do with their building. So whether that's price per square foot uh, or the amenity space, but what they don't need to compete on is the environment. They can share information about how they're achieving these efficiencies in their buildings. And then lastly, we celebrate our members' achievements. If you have achieved the 2030 goals uh, or gone above and beyond, then we want to celebrate that. We want to showcase that work uh, and show other building owners in Seattle what's possible and how you did it. So we'll do that with either case studies uh, or we'll also do it through the Vision Awards, uh, which I'll touch upon a little bit later. Uh, second here, uh, I, I want to touch upon our 2020 progress report. Uh, I think Olivia is going to put this in the chat or a link to this in the chat. We just released this a couple of months ago and it goes through all of the work that we've done over the last kind of three years ish um, and gives a timeline of when we started to what we've achieved to date uh, in all energy, water and transportation. It highlights a couple of projects that have done great work and then it also uh, we touch upon what's coming next. So looking towards the future, what are the things that we think are going to be uh, kind of big changes that will help us get to our goals? Um, kind of an asterisk to that, this was written post-COVID. Um, I think a lot of the stuff in looking forward still applies, um, but slightly different lens to it. Um, uh, I mentioned our vision awards. Usually this is something that is uh, an in-person event, but we're reimagining it this year to be a virtual event. So uh, say the day, October 15th from 4 till 5 p.m. Uh, again, the link is just being posted by Olivia. Thank you, Olivia. Um, we have Jamie Margolin as a keynote speaker. Those of you who don't know Jamie, she is a young climate activist uh, who I mean, quite frankly, it is, is changing the world and changing the conversation. Um, so super excited to have her as a keynote and then we're taking nominations right now. If you have an exemplary building that is uh, achieving great things in either energy, water or reducing your transportation emissions, or you think you have an exemplary building that does all three, uh, then go to the website and the nominations are open there. Uh, so, Next uh, slide. Lastly, I just want to thank our annual sponsors um, and our funders real quick. Uh, particularly in times like these, we really can't do our work without uh, the support of these great organizations. Um, they, they really help us 
kind of keep the lights on, um, LED lights, of course. Um, and without that, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do and work with the great organizations such as Commute Seattle. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dylan and Sarah so that we can learn about all this great transportation stuff that's going to be coming. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, so just to get us started, we're going to talk about the transportation landscape here, um, past, present, and what we're looking at uh, in the near future. Um, real quick before we do that, I just wanted to say I recognize that some of you may not be familiar with Commute Seattle, um, but thank you for so much for joining us. Um, Commute Seattle is a nonprofit public private partnership between the Downtown Seattle Association, Seattle Department of Transportation, King County Metro, and Sound Transit. Um, and we get some support from WashDOT and the Port of Seattle as well. Um, but we're really focused on commute management, um, reducing the number of folks driving alone to downtown, um, and making sure that employers and um, property managers are providing transportation options for their employees and tenants. Um, <clears throat> So just to set the stage here, we know that property managers and as property managers and building owners, you have a ton of knowledge and expertise around what it takes to keep your operations running smoothly. Um, and that right now, uh, it's a really strange, difficult time for a lot of us. And in addition to your usual responsibilities, the COVID-19 pandemic has added a lot of complex factors um, that you'll need to think about in your operating plans and as Washington moves through the phases of reopening. Um, you're likely keeping up with changing regulatory requirements in order to keep your tenants safe, um, researching and pricing out new technology, using this time to work on maintenance projects, fielding questions from tenants, fine-tuning cleaning and sanitation, upgrading HVAC, the list goes on and on. So um, you have a lot on your plate and are busy, and we really appreciate uh, you joining us here today. Um, we're here today to talk not just about things that you're already working on inside of your building, but really how people are getting to your building, the things that are happening outside and up to your front doors. Um, so we're going to talk to you about how we anticipate your tenants will be arriving once there's a, a broader return to the office, um, what we know so far about return to work trends, and how you can prepare your properties to help support those trends um, or counteract them in the coming months. We really want to provide you with knowledge so that you can make informed decisions and help have your tenants uh, have a safe, seamless experience on their return to work. Um, and we're here as a resource, like Matthew said, um, if you have any questions or concerns um, going forward as well, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'll include some contact information at the end. So to set the scene a little bit, um, this is some information on what the commute mode split looked like to downtown Seattle pre-COVID-19. Um, so the transportation landscape before this pandemic was, um, you know, we, we capture this every other year um, in the fall of odd numbered years. We do a survey of commuters in Seattle to find out how they're getting to and from work. Um, and this breakdown shows that in fall of 2019, about 46% of people were taking transit to downtown, which is you know, almost half of, of commute trips were on transit. Um, that equates to about 135,000 trips per day, which is quite substantial. Um, drive alone trips accounted for just about a quarter or 78,000 trips per day. Um, and then biking and walking were 3%, 7% respectively, so a little bit smaller group. But um, the main takeaway here is that transit was, was a really big part of that. Um, so looking, diving a little bit into transit, pre-COVID we're used to really crowded buses and light rail. If you're a transit rider like me, it's not out of the ordinary to be in the middle of a pack of people like you see here in this picture. Um, normally the buses uh, that King County Metro runs carried a max of 65 for the, the just standard bus or 100 people for that articulated bus with the accordion in the middle. Um, and Oftentimes those capacities were probably on the low end of the cement, you know, people were just packed in like sardines. But with the current environment, it's hard to imagine getting back to that level of capacity anytime soon. Um, and in fact, right now, we see with transit that with current social distancing measures, buses can only carry about 12 to 18 people at any given time. Um, King County Metro especially and, and, and Sound Transit are really taking stride, making strides to keep people safe, um, but keep people getting where they're going. But that means we're looking at about an 80% reduction or more of the number of people who can be on a bus at any given time. In addition, King County Metro and Sound Transit are asking that people are reserving transit for essential trips only. Um, 
And that may start to expand a little bit in the coming months, but right now we're still really limited, which means that's trips for work to essential jobs, access to food, medicine, and essential needs. And really, we want to make sure that transit is available for those who absolutely need it um, so that they're not left standing on the, at the bus stop being passed by uh, a bunch of buses that have those, that 12 to 18 maximum people on them. Um, these social distancing measures are likely to go on for some time and in addition we're going to see some service reductions unfortunately in September. Um, King County Metro is looking at um, only having about 85% of the service that they had pre-COVID when the September schedule uh, service change goes into effect. So if we think about that 46% of people that used to commute to downtown on transit and the reduced capacity that we have right now, there's not going to be capacity to serve that many riders. Um, and in addition, many people won't be comfortable taking transit for a while because of public health perspective. Um, so where are those folks gonna turn to? Um, one possibility, which we'll talk about next year, is driving. Um, this, this breaks our hearts a little bit at Commute Seattle because we're trying to reduce the number of folks driving, but we do expect that many commuters will turn to driving. Um, this could be a big issue because before COVID, the parking capacity downtown was very full. We've already heard a commute Seattle from a number of uh, property managers and companies saying we only have X number of parking spaces in our building and they're always full. So we're gonna have a shortage. Um, and where are those people gonna park? But even if we fill every single parking space downtown, um, we're gonna have an issue before that because our system of roads will be immediately overtaxed. Um, we already have traffic, even with that 46% of people taking transit downtown. Um, and if a good chunk of those people start driving as well, we're gonna see congestion quickly. We'll have tenants and staff and their staff sitting in traffic, angry and frustrated. Um, and the traffic could spill into neighboring streets and even keep emergency vehicles and, and um, the like from reaching destinations in a timely matter. So that's, that's a situation we want to avoid as much as possible. Um, you know, it may feel like you can't necessarily change a lot um, of this with, as a property manager, but it's important for you to be aware of these potential trends to make as many plans as you can to get ahead of this. In addition to the transit crush that we're gonna see and the potential for increased congestion due to that, um, we're now also facing the closure of the West Seattle Bridge. Uh, this was closed unexpectedly in March due to some safety issues and SDOT is working really hard to make sure uh, to determine what the next plan uh, forward will be for the West Seattle Bridge. Um, but what we do know is that it was the highest traffic street in Seattle prior to its closure. We had 100,000 people a day driving over it and 25,000 on transit. Um, so this is a really big deal. Um, the left pie chart here shows that in 2019, during our peak eastbound morning commute hours, so eastbound into downtown, car trips made up about 82% of all trips crossing the Duwamish. Um, going forward, looking at just the, the sheer numbers we have to reach due to the, um, the limits in capacity, about 53% of those driving trips will need to change to different modes. So this is just another challenge on top of the phased reopening challenges we're already going to see during the pandemic. Um, but we can learn from the past. So we had a huge highway closure last year, if some of you remember, in January and February with the viaduct being closed um, and the tunnel not yet open. Um, so there was a ton of messaging and communication out there around what was happening. And we um, saw an increase in remote work of about 243%. So we can change behavior like that pretty rapidly. So what does this all mean? Um, well, a few trends that we're looking at going forward is that many people will continue to work from home home. Um, this might be full-time work from home, but it might also just be more flexible schedules, being in the office two times a week and home three times a week, etc. Um, we also think that many commuters will um, instinctively turn to driving alone to work if that's an option for them, just out of a pure safety, a uh, feeling of safety. Um, but we can mitigate that a bit by offering many choices and communicating those choices and, and nudge behaviors in a different direction to prevent a huge shift to driving alone. Um, and finally, uh, we also think that there will be a trend of many commuters seeking out active commutes, such as biking, walking, scooters, and running, especially if they're just coming into the office a few times a week. Uh, we've seen a huge uptick in bike sales across the country, but especially in the Seattle area, um, even seeing it referred to as the new toilet paper with it being off, with bikes being off the shelves so much that people can't find them. Um, so we think that'll be a big trend as well. So how do we know all this? Well, to get a little more into that, Sarah is gonna talk uh, about a survey that we did in May. 
Awesome. Thanks so much, Dylan. Um, great overview. So a little bit of information here. How did we arrive at some of these conclusions? Uh, these trends come from data from a survey that we did that was open for two weeks in May. So the survey went out to about 3,000 Seattle workplaces by email and we received around 415 responses from 22 different industries. Um, so most respondents were located in downtown Seattle and the surrounding areas. About 63% were from smaller businesses, so more of like less than 100 employees, and about 37% of respondents were from larger businesses with more than 100 employees. Um, so I'm gonna review some of these return to work trends that we started to see in our survey, which hopefully might give you some more insights into your tenants' plans going forward. Uh, so there are quite a few news articles lately and different studies around working remotely. Of course, it's in the, it's in the news, we're hearing about it, um, but we just wanted to verify these numbers with our audience and ask people what was going on. So we asked what percentage of staff are currently working remotely and found that for almost three quarters of workplaces, they have 80 to 100% of their staff working remotely. So quite a few. Um, many of you have seen in the news, you know, Google announced working from home until at least summer 2021. Amazon is till January. Um, obviously we're seeing this from those big companies and we're all keeping tabs on it to see what's gonna happen. Um, we also know that there are many essential workers and countless roles out there that cannot be performed remotely. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, we wanna make sure that these people are able to get to work safely and do their jobs with minimal exposure to COVID. And another chart here, I think this one is really quite telling. We asked two questions. One, what the workplace's remote work culture was like before COVID, and then two, what they anticipate it will be afterwards. So you can really see a big shift here. Um, the blue bars at the top are much larger there with saying that they never worked remotely or maybe once or a few times a month. And then the answers really shift to a few times a week um, in orange. So bottom line, most companies do anticipate an increase in remote work. Uh, at the same time, 23% were unsure what their remote work culture might look like after COVID. So there's definitely an opportunity here to educate, to start those conversations, and to even change behavior a little bit. Another question that we asked was, from your perspective, how is remote going for your workplace? And 81% of companies said that working remotely is going well or very well. So this really adds to the narrative about tenants shifting to allow more work from home than before COVID. Um, so that's something we're looking into as well, how to improve that experience. And even though many are working remotely right now, there are still challenges. Um, and the, these difficulties definitely fuel the desire to return to the office. So 55% of respondents said that not all roles can be done remotely. Um, in addition, people are having trouble communicating between coworkers. Um, employees have distractions at home. There's definitely a lot of questions around childcare, especially as we go into September and when school should be starting. So there's definitely a really big desire to return to the physical workspace. And it's mostly a question of how to do so safely and when the time is right. And then finally, we asked respondents to note which changes they expect to make related to the commuter benefits that they offer their employees. So 57% said that they will allow employees to work from home more often. So again, that same trend. And then 37 or 39% said introducing staggered schedules or flexible arrival times. So just shifting away from the peak commute hours um, to allow people to ride transit or allow people to get there um, when there's less people out and about. So some also plan to change their transit subsidies. So whether they give an ORCA card or not, um, to promote active commuting or even to make it easier for employees to drive to work. Um, so we know that tenants and companies are thinking about these factors and a lot of other things on the mind. Um, there's definitely an opportunity for you all to adapt to, adapt to these changes from the building side as well. Um, so one of the most significant areas that we might see change is with driving and with parking. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dylan to talk about that. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yes, so as the survey data that Sarah just shared shows, we're expecting a, a potential uptick in remote work and also in employers being really flexible with their employees on how they get to work and when they get to work. Um, 
all the talk of remote work may seem worrisome, especially in the realm of commercial real estate. Um, but like that data showed, we do see anticipate more of an increase in part-time work from home, especially in the long term, rather than full-time. Um, it is a, almost a sure bet that we'll see some major shifts, though, in commute behavior um, for many of the reasons that we've already outlined. Um, and one of those, as we talked about before, is likely to be an increase in solo driving, um, which impacts uh, parking and parking management. Um, in fact, a recent survey that was published by a uh, commercial real estate firm, JLL, said that 34% of previous transit riders have indicated they'll seek alternate forms of transportation post-pandemic. So that's a big shift. Uh, that's across the, the country, across the world, but we do ex expect to see similar things in Seattle. Um, we're also seeing that traffic levels in other countries and other areas that have started uh, more of a reopening after a lockdown have gone way up. Um, in Wuhan, China, which was the initial epicenter, um, traffic almost doubled after the lockdown was lifted and traffic in many areas of the U.S. has crept back up towards a normal level, even without fully returning to offices for a lot of people. Um, so there are some strategies um, that we can utilize to, to minimize this um, potential car apocalypse. Um, and one of those is um, utilizing parking management in the best way possible to allow uh, flexibility. Uh, so as I just said, flexibility is going to be really key with parking management. Um, I'm sure all of you, uh, if you manage or own properties and buildings, um, have parking facilities as part of that. Um, and with tenants continuing to work from home right now, um, we do anticipate that some, if they haven't already, will have some employees starting to return um, before too long and slowly ramp up that staff presence for an eventual return. Um, again, the trends that we're seeing are that more people will want to drive in the coming months or years, um, but we don't have that parking or road capacity for this, um, especially if everybody decides to commute at the same time that they were before and we have a huge peak commute commute time between 7 and 9 a.m. Um, again, many staff will likely continue to couple remote work uh, with them occasionally driving to the office when they do need to, to come back due to that limited transit capacity and feelings of not being safe. Or some might just also have a discomfort or inability to take active modes uh, because they either live too far or don't live in an area that supports that. Um, so with this increase, we, do, we anticipate that it will be an increased number of more intermittent drivers. Um, so it won't necessarily be um, won't necessarily be a huge uptick in people driving to work every single day, um, but there may be many folks who are working from home three days a week and driving in two days a week. So again, flexibility is going to be really key, um, and that means it's an important time to consider adapting parking policies and fee structures to support this need for flexibility um, and to keep the office spaces accessible to tenants and commuters when they need them. Um, so one key way to do this, um, which some of you may have already uh, started or may already be, have in practice, is to switch from a monthly uh, parking fee setup to a daily parking fee setup. Um, this, is, this is kind of one of the key ways to mitigate or manage demand. Um, and so it's good, it's good to evaluate parking fees and payment structures at this time. Monthly parking doesn't offer a lot of flexibility to commuters. Um, basically, if I'm paying for a monthly parking pass, I'm gonna drive as often as possible to get all the value that I can out of that pass. Um, so it encourages individual drivers to drive and park more often. But if people are now having the opportunity to work from home a few days a week, suddenly the math on that par monthly parking pass might not make a lot of sense. But it, they may, individuals who are still commuting in a couple days a week may feel that they are only comfortable with driving and feel that the monthly pass doesn't really give them that opportunity. Um, so a daily parking structure allows a greater number of commuters to drive and park when they need to um, while offering flexibility for working from home or even walking or biking um, or other modes on the other days without feeling like they're losing something that they paid up front for this pass and that they're losing something by giving up a day of driving. Um, I know that there's a lot of income security with having monthly pass systems. You can know at the beginning of the month basically what your income from parking is going to be. Um, so if there are concerns about that, one potential hybrid option could be having reserved passes for certain days of the week or for certain weeks in the month. Um, this would go hand in hand with one trend that we're seeing as possible 
possible with um, a lot of employers, which is giving employees or having employees come in on a kind of an A, B schedule. Um, so that may be um, within the week, having a certain group of employees come in on Monday, Wednesday, for example, and, so, and the other half coming in on Tuesday, Thursday, or it could be week to week. So having one uh, handful of employees come in one week and another the next. Um, so in those scenarios, having a monthly pass wouldn't necessarily make sense, but being able to split that up and have certain people come in Tuesday and Thursday and know that they'll have a parking spot, others be able to come in and have a Monday, Wednesday parking pass could, could help. And it would give some, uh, you know, knowledge that you'll have uh, parkers coming in. Another option for managing through this really um, challenging time, managing parking through this challenging time and offering flexibility is having dynamic parking fees. Um, so this means adjusting parking rates based on the time of day or length of stay. Um, this is something that a lot of garages already do, um, especially garages attached to you know, shopping centers and more kind of um, yeah, commercial spaces, but in terms of office space, um, it's an important consideration. Uh, like I mentioned before, if we have increased driving during that peak commute time from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., we're gonna see come up against some real um, congestion issues. So um, not to mention if people are all arriving at the garage at, at a similar time, um, it'll make it really hard to socially distance in the garage, in common areas within your buildings and in elevators especially. Um, so by offering variable pricing during time of day that could encourage folks to come in either earlier or later than that peak, um, you'll be able to kind of flatten that peak commute uh, commute time and allow people to pay a little bit less potentially early bird parking is something that already exists in a lot of places, but having a, a, a lower price for coming in after 9 a.m. as well. Another option that I'll just mention briefly briefly would be um, having it be variable by length of time. So there's a potential that employees might need to drive in to pick something up at the office or for an important meeting, but then they'll finish the rest of their day from home. So being able to support that flexibility um, is important as well. Um, so those quick trips might not be efficient by transit or active modes because they take too long for the time people are going to be spending in the office. But if you shift a few of your spaces that were designated for all day employee parking to shorter term parking um, and potentially even offer a discounted rate for the first couple of hours. So for example, um, the first four hours could be $6 an hour and then boost that up to $10, just throwing out a couple of numbers. But um, after uh, for hours five through eight, you know, that gives people the opportunity to come in when they need to um, and not have to pay for a full day of parking. Finally, the last bit of flexibility that would be useful to explore in your parking facilities is flexibility with how you use the space. Um, this may not be where people go initially, but we do anticipate that carpool and van pool will probably come back for a lot of people before transit and that some transit riders will shift to carpooling and van pooling. Um, it allows people to still share rides, but to have more control over that environment. Um, so it could be a good idea to support those folks by uh, providing specific convenient spaces, maybe near the elevators um, for those commuters who are driving high occupancy vehicles like a van pool or carpool, um, because, and to reward them for helping to reduce the burden on parking on, uh, on our streets. Um, you can also offer discounted spaces for those folks. And then just one thing to mention is shuttles. Um, if you are, uh, if your property houses an employer who runs an employer shuttle program, um, the current recommendation is for those programs to have an increased number of shuttles, with decreased number of riders per shuttle. So how can you prepare for that if your tenants have shuttles that come to your buildings? I know a lot of that happens at the curbside, but if those shuttles are interacting with your properties at all, it's important to consider adaptations that you might have to make. Um, so in addition to an increase in driving, um, we're also seeing potential evidence of a shift towards commute, uh, to, towards active commutes on returning to offices. So in conjunction with making your daily parking uh, transparently priced and convenient for folks, consider providing amenities, subsidies, et cetera, for active commutes. And Sarah's gonna talk a bit more about active commutes and how best to support those. Yeah, thanks Dylan. So exactly, hand in hand with making daily parking transparently priced, um, it, it can be really important to provide amenities and even subsidies for active commuters. Uh, people will be less likely to drive in and park if there are appealing alternatives that are easy for them. Uh, active commuting doesn't only mean biking, it's also people walking to work, running, um, riding scooters, those solo wheels and more. There's a lot of options these days. So the pandemic really is going to have lasting effects on people's behavior. Each of us are going to do everything we can to ensure our own health and safety. Um, so many people are actually realizing that they live close enough to make active commutes possible. 
um, they might realize this, they might realize that driving and parking isn't always feasible for them. So we're gonna see an expansion of those commute modes. But um, how can you enable people to choose active commute modes and reduce this demand on parking? One of the biggest things to do is keep shower and locker room facilities open. Some people might view these as kind of added amenities or like nice to have bonuses, but in reality, these are quite essential for people who are um, doing active commutes. If you think about the summertime, um, even walking a few blocks to a meeting or to the office can make you kind of sweaty. So many people who walk, bike, or run to work really rely on the ability to shower there. Um, in addition to that, being able to store their personal items is really important. You think about it like shampoo, a brush or a comb, towel, shower shoes, and a change of clothes. Being able to put those in a locker really makes a difference on their daily routine and just that mental energy that's expended on getting to your desk. So going back to work in any capacity in the coming months will use extra mental energy because of COVID. So anything that can be done to make things easier is going to be a really big plus for commuters. So what do the studies say about this? Do locker rooms really matter? Um, there have been some studies, um, such as this one by Ralph Bueller in Washington, D.C., which shows that the odds for cycling to work are greater for employees with access to both cyclist showers and bike parking at work compared to those with just bike parking, but no showers at work. So there are some studies around it um, to support this. And uh, if you have great facilities like locker rooms and showers, it can be really attractive to tenants in the long term. And it can also give you a leg up over other properties. So I'd say that there are long term benefits to consider there. Um, we have heard that buildings are closing their lockers or closing their showers because of fears of keeping additional areas of the building clean. Um, but if it has been deemed safe to open the building, including bathrooms, elevators, and common areas, and if a plan has been put into place for cleaning those high touch areas, I would really recommend just make sure that those plans extend to the locker rooms and the showers as well as any other facilities. Um, really, there shouldn't be a reason to only keep the shower closed if it's been deemed that the rest of the building can open. So um, as always, just follow CDC guidelines for cleaning and disinfecting facilities. I'm sure everyone is um, very knowledgeable on that. A couple of additional things that you might consider. Um, you can remove porous materials such as fabric shower curtains and replace them with surfaces that are slightly easier to disinfect. Um, there's little things you can do like changing from physical keys into a locker or bike room to those touchless key cards. Um, in addition, using signage to indicate policies and proper spacing for users, of course, is gonna be very important with all kinds of things in buildings. And in addition, suggesting flexible arrival times to space out the use of those facilities. A lot of people arrive at 8 or 9 a.m., but just mentioning to people, consider arriving at 8.20 um, could be useful. So using email communications to send those notes out to people. So how could you make active commuting a breeze, especially for people who are new to it? Really, it should be easy, quick, and intuitive to park your bike or scooter to get to the locker room and to get to your desk. So make sure to think through how people get from a garage entrance to the bike room, to the elevator. Um, many, commuters, many commuters have really never explored certain areas of the building. So there will be new active commuters. Um, make it as easy on them as possible. They will be very grateful for it. And really employees need a, the peace of mind that their bike or their scooter is safe while they work. I know personally, I wouldn't leave my bike on a city of Seattle street rack for my entire eight hour workday, it would make me a little uncomfortable. So um, good storage is clearly labeled, it's accessible, it's intuitive, well lit, often close to a building entrance or showers and sheltered from the elements. So some things to keep in mind. But if you don't have any existing bike rooms, some ideas are to convert a parking space to bike storage, even if that's temporary. Um, six to 12 bikes can be parked in a parking space. So that's just kind of a creative idea to consider. Um, you can also allow commuters to park their bikes next to, next to their desk, even just temporarily again. Um, allowing tenants to convert a conference room to bike storage is something that we've heard people doing. A lot of conference rooms can't even be used safely in the whole COVID era. So it's a controlled environment. Tenants know who's going in there. Um, that's an option as well. And then finally, 
um, it's really important to do a walkthrough to consider all the ways and all the reasons that people might arrive to your building by foot, by bike, by car. Think about visitors, even mail and deliveries. Um, we each have biases that we bring and norms that we um, you know, live in, even if we don't realize it. So it can be really important to consider how different people get from the street to the building and their wayfinding through the office. Yeah, that's what we've got around active commutes. We're always happy to talk about this. Um, you're always welcome to schedule a consultation with Commute Seattle. I've got some info here. Um, just a note that the next TMP requirement that's coming up for some of you um, listening are gonna be receiving this email next week and your program reports will be due on October 1st. So that's kind of the next thing coming from Commute Seattle that you can keep an eye out for. And you can view our upcoming events on our commute connections on my website as well. So now if anyone has any questions, you can put those into the Q&A box or chat them to us. Just while there's a, a little bit of silence while people are typing away, um, I have a, a quick question. Daily parking is something that we um, have been trying to do for a while now, probably with with you guys as well. Um, do you think it's something that has the potential to continue after COVID once people potentially realize the benefits of it? Yeah, I certainly do. Um, I think we definitely promote uh, daily parking as a good way to manage commutes, um, both with our employers and properties that we work with, Matthew. Um, so that's a great question. We've been um, talking about daily parking for a while now. Um, again, it's just something where monthly parking um, can be very comfortable as a property manager. Again, you have kind of that security of a certain amount of income every month, but um, it really doesn't promote people making choices. Um, and as we talked about, a lot of people are multimodal or consider doing different things on different days. Um, so it can both be limiting in that um, you know, you're limiting the number of choices somebody makes. If I pay $400 for a monthly parking pass, I'm going to use every, get every dollar I can out of that versus uh, if I, you know, if, if there's a daily parking uh, fee structure, um, I might think a couple times about driving if, if I'm paying, you know, $32 a day. Um, and there may be certain days on the flip side, if I'm usually a transit commuter, but for whatever reason, you know, I, I, I'm late to childcare or need to run some errands or something, I might want to drive on a certain day. It's nice to be able to know that, um, you know, I'm not locked out of potentially driving if there's a, a daily parking um, option. So we're really at Commute Seattle all about giving people choices and allowing people to make decisions on a regular basis about how they commute. Um, and I think daily parking definitely has a place going forwards. Um, and honestly, I mean, there's going to be a huge demand for, for parking um, based on what we're hearing and seeing in other places, um, especially in the next coming months and years. So if you've been thinking about experimenting with that, um, this is a really good time to do it. Um, I think that there, there's a good chance that you won't actually lose out on much because people will be driving every day and you may have more spots full because um, those folks who aren't, who would have had a monthly pass and might not drive in every day, um, their spots will be will be used by folks who are, are commuting in on the alternate days. I wonder just while, while people are doing a Q&A, I was just, Let's just give a kind of a brief summary and maybe that will jog some questions out of people's minds. Um, there was obviously there was a lot of information covered there, but kind of the key points that I really took out of this were uh, pre-COVID around about 46% of people were using public transit. Um, and even pre-COVID, we had a short supply of parking and congestion was still bad. Uh, with 26 26% uh, of people driving alone to work. So that only has the potential uh, to get worse if everyone uh, decides to drive to work after this. Uh, but based on the survey that you guys did, more people are likely going to be working remotely uh, as it is uh, evidence shows that it's going pretty well. But uh, the fact is that not everyone can work remotely in some of those positions. So there's always going to be a need for people to come into work. So some strategies that are out there, 
the big overall message to me was just be flexible. So we just talked about uh, daily parking. So thinking about moving towards daily parking or dynamic parking fees and then being flexible with your space. So as things continue to change, think about incentivizing different things. So van or carpools are likely to come in to affect before people use transit. If you have access to shuttles, think about using that because you have a lot more control over what's happening there. And then active commuting uh, is hopefully, personally, I hope that kind of increases. Um, so providing showers and locker rooms uh, and then good bike storage. And there's a lot of opportunities there to either convert a parking space using conference rooms or storage um, and other strategies. And then the last important thing I think was, was doing a walkthrough of how people are arriving to your building. And I think that's something that you should be doing or continue to do so you can really think about what's, what's changing in your building. That sounds like a great summary. Thank you, Matthew. Um, we, um, I, I, I think we only had this time designated actually through 945, Sarah just reminded me. So um, we will, uh, we do have a question here in the Q&A um, from Bobby, which is, are we aware of any employers offering stipends to commuters that want to purchase bikes, scooters, or other micro mobility options? Um, I think this is something that we have seen from a few employers in the past. It's not necessarily the most common benefit, um, but we were actually just talking before we opened this webinar up, and I think, Matthew, you were saying you've heard of this in the UK, potentially. Um, not as much here, but... Yeah, I, so one thing that we're, we're trying to work on a little bit during this time is uh, an incentive for exactly what you're saying, Bobby. So in the UK, the, the British government provides uh, a bike to work scheme that allows uh, employers to help their employees purchase a bike and then pay that off through their paycheck. Um, so it's something that I think a lot of people have utilized in, in the recent months uh, while they've been working from home so they could purchase that bike and still get outside to do exercise. So it's, uh, I think would be a great way to encourage more active commuting, particularly if, fingers crossed, things start to open up a little bit more during the summer when the weather is nice, and we can get people on, on their bikes, get used to it, and then when the weather starts changing, hopefully they love it so much that they'll continue to do that in the rain of the winter time as well. We'll just say specifically here in Seattle, I haven't heard of any employers or I don't think we're aware of any employers that have made this shift um, due to COVID necessarily. Um, most of the stipends around active commuting that we've seen in the past have been around um, giving employees some money for regular, regular repairs or for um, gear associated with it. Um, so for um, you know, shoes, bags, et cetera. Um, not so much for the bikes and scooters themselves, but that's a great idea going forward that we definitely would love to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say the one shift that we have seen during COVID is shifting to give like a daily stipend to commuters for biking or walking. So for example, like $4 per day that you bike or walk to the office. So we have actually seen a bit of a shift in that way, more on that daily motivation, um, which is definitely really great. So. Yeah, we have a couple of great case studies on that on our website as well. A couple of videos that we've given Vision Awards to people who've done that just because it really does make a huge difference in the amount of people that will get out of their car and bike or take transit as a, an incentive to do so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Wonderful. Well, we are over time, so I think um, we can call this good and thank you all so much for joining the webinar we appreciate you listening in i know everyone's busy these days so and thanks to dylan and matthew for jumping on and olivia for ma monitoring the chat box as well thanks everyone thanks everyone great Take care. Have a good one. bye